Well, good afternoon, everybody. Come on, you could do better than that. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Are you ready to have some fun? We're going to talk about employees. And by the way, it's not just employees, it's doctors, but employees and doctors behaving badly. Oh, no, let's, let's open it up. It's employees, it's doctors, it's practice managers, it's, pra- it's hospital administrators, it's practice owners, it's consultants acting badly. Never consultants. Never yeah. consultants. <laughs> um, my name is Mark Opperman. Sheila Gross and is my partner. If you guys are not familiar with us and we're with VMC, we welcome you. And... Um, This is uh, a fun, fun presentation. We did it just once before. Uh, We're going to start really expanding this a lot. But we've consulted with over 1,500 practices around the country. And believe me, we have learned and seen a lot of different things and different practices. Um, So we decided that we're going to take some of that information, we're going to put it into a seminar, and teach you uh, maybe about some of these things um, and what we uh, can do to avoid some of these employee behaving badly situations here. Um, And, you know, we have gone through this. Uh, The names have been changed to protect the guilty, but um, we're going to, you know, give you some real-life scenarios here that we're going to go through and discuss. And then you're actually going to get to pick and choose what it is that you want to talk about and what you would like to discuss. And Sheila and I are going to kind of go up and back on this and facilitate it with you. So we have um, four sessions today that we're going to do, one before lunch, and then we're going to be doing four um, or three after lunch. And what we're going to do is we're going to give you in each session three cases to choose from. Again, these are kind of real-life situations that we have uh, put together and just want to give you information on. Um, We're going to give you uh, the information, um, what's happened in all those. We're going to talk about it, um, discuss what we can do to maybe avoid these things from happening in the future in your own practice. And then we have a bunch of tools that we're going to help you with as well. Um, such as policies on, um, you know, uh, drug, uh, you know, use and uh, um, veterinary services reduce rate, those kind of things that we'll make available for you so you don't have to recreate a lot of this as well in your own practice. So we want you to go back with some really excellent tools that you'll be able to implement in your hospital, okay? Um, the first choices that you have are, we have three cases for you, CSI, and that is dealing with controlled substances, which we know never happens in anybody's practice. Number two, we're going to deal with the theft. Number uh, three, we're going to deal with a harassment issue. So let's vote on these and decide which of these that you might like to do. Um, How many want to deal, and we'll maybe get two cases done if we're lucky in each hour, so we'll see how it goes. But how many want to do the uh, controlled substance case? Okay, the druggies put up their hand, okay? Um, Theft, theft. Woohoo! Theft is popular. Harassment. Ooh, I think we're going to do theft and harassment. Theft and harassment? Oh, and not just any kind of harassment. Well, harassment's (laughs) in any shape or form here. So let us go to our theft scenario here. Yes. And then, uh, you know, I had uh, a, someone at a clinic recently explain uh, kind of how it feels sometimes. They said, it's almost like you're a clinic and you live on an island and you have to figure out all of these things on your own. So what's most important about these cases is, first off, you're not alone. Uh, I've had several people come up after this meeting and say, that was us, wasn't it? You were talking about us. <laughs> it's just the fact that you are not alone. And talking through these things, sharing your experiences, gives you the opportunity to see, okay, what could I do differently? How could I set things up? What proactive uh, activities can I engage in to assure that um, we're headed in the right track, that we understand each other real well, and that we have the kind of relationships with our team members, our clients, that we want to have. So let's look at um, this case of embezzlement. Once again, we use composites of cases. So uh, we're not said these names have been changed to protect uh, the innocent and the guilty. Um, So first off, Helen's in your practice. She's been there forever. You remember when she came in and started 24 years ago with the practice. Um, she's been there with Dr. Simmons since he purchased the practice, knows everything. All of Everybody talks about um, Helen being um, part. She is family to a lot of your clients. 
Um, Paul was brought on as your practice manager in the last uh, year or so. Um, he brought in a lot of experience, and one of those things was he wanted to have an internal cash control. So he wanted to have an end-of-day procedure uh, so that we had all of our cash accounted for and we closed our books at the end of our business days. Since Paul's done that, uh, there seems to be end-of-day balancing issues. In fact, on most days, it doesn't match up. You know, sometimes it's only, you know, $30, $40. Sometimes it's a few hundred dollars. So um, he's found that the shortages only occur, strangely enough, when Helen is working, just one of the the components of that. He's taken these concerns to Dr. Simmons, the practice owner, uh, and Dr. Simmons basically says, I can't imagine that she's stealing. It's just a bookkeeping error. or There's something else going on. Um, She loves the practice. She loves the client. She'd never do anything like that. It's preposterous that you would make those types of statements about her. Um, So that's what you know. What other questions do you want to ask about this case? What else do you want to know? Real life situation, I will tell you at the end of the day that there was an over $34,000 embezzlement occurring from this practice. Um, So any other information you'd like to know about this before we look at what we might do to stop it, prohibit it from happening? Do we have any questions? Yes, ma'am? What did Helen do? She was the receptionist within the practice. Yep. So she was taking uh, the payments at, she was uh, the, the head receptionist. She was taking payments at the front desk, both cash, check, et cetera. Yep. Yep. Yes. Was there any cameras on the premise? No, there were not. Nope. Everybody loves Helen. Helen is wonderful. Um, there she's sweet. The clients love her. You know, the other employees love her. You know, she she's- and you know one of the things that when interviewing the team members that they said, you know, she's the one who knits you the baby blanket to give to you at the baby shower. Um, she gives gifts on everybody's birthday. She does wonderful giving things for Dr. Simmons. It, it just seems like unbelievable amount of of nice comes out of Helen, and dollars come out of Helen. Is there anybody double-checking the practice manager on this? At this point, no. Um, It's the manager who has brought this to Dr. Simmons' attention. Uh, The owner was totally unaware of any of this prior to that. Um, Was not doing any end of day. You know how we do cash drug justification? Nope, wasn't doing any of that. Uh, Manager instituted, that's when they start seeing some discrepancies occur. They've had three occasions where clients have come back and wanted a refund, and they couldn't find the original purchase. But they just saw it was no big deal, you know, bookkeeping error. Yes, sir. <laughs> Say that again for me. Not that we found any. She's asked if there's anything sitting around with tick marks or coins or anything. No, uh, didn't find anything within the practice, any of those signs. Yes? Were there separate trust boxes at the receptionist's case? Or did they all work with it? Just one. Um, and it's only one doctor practice, so it's not all that big of a practice either. When the trust checks occurred, when the clients came to see the bill, were the bills running through the Helen, uh, like she's asking, do we do the tra- transactions as they go? Um, he- Helen, um, because she had been there so long, the other two receptionists that were there, a lot of them, they were running and getting the uh, prescriptions, picking up the diets, all that kind of stuff. She did um, almost exclusively all of the invoicing. Um, okay, just to, to move this forward a little bit here, because we can, you know, there's lots and lots of thoughts and questions. Um, but first of all, do you feel that this is embezzlement or incompetence going on here? Yeah. We all pretty sure it's embezzlement. How do you know? Maybe she's just you know, really dyslexic, and maybe she can't count, and maybe she makes really big cash errors. How, how do you guys come to that conclusion? Why, how is, I mean, it's easy to jump to that, but is there any concrete evidence here? Wouldn't you be over sometimes? Um, probably, but we haven't at this point. It's always been under, so that might be one thing that's 
leading us yeah. to that assumption. So tell us, how will you investigate? What, what, type, what steps will you take to find out what's happening? What's the first thing you're going to do? What are you going to do? Okay. So she okay. wants to go to hell. If I saw somebody shake your head, no, you don't want to do that? She wouldn't do that? I'm kind of, what, afraid you're going to tip your hat on that one? Okay, maybe, maybe. What else? How are you going to investigate this? Your, your cash, well, your checks, your reconciliation. Your, 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 the manager was doing that. They were, man, were doing the end of mm-hmm. day now. But again, it's we're coming up short in the cash periodically. Sometimes $30, sometimes $100, but it was... I mean, we, we know that there is a shortage problem. We just don't know if it's incompetence or if it's embezzlement or who's doing it, what's doing it, how it's happening. So you, all right, and, and I'm going to jump ahead here because you're going to see this in a second, but one out of 10 veterinary hospitals are embezzled from every single year. This is a fact. One out of 10 veterinary hospitals are embezzled from every single year. To be considered embezzlement, it has to be over $10,000. How many in this room have had an embezzlement occur in their practices? Wow. Look at that. And the rest of you don't know what's happening. Um, but um, <laughs> seriously, this is a really big issue. And, and we got it. This is important. We got to look at how we're going to establish this, find out about it, and again, hopefully stop it in the future as well. Um, Sheila and I were just privileged enough to be over in Australia and New Zealand. We were doing some lectures over there. And in one of our lectures, there was probably about um, 60, 70 people, and I asked that question about embezzlement, and about 30 or 40 people put their hand up. Um, it's even worse over there than I think it is in some of our uh, practices in the state, so it's pretty amazing. So the question is, how are we going to investigate this? What is it that we're going to do to determine whether you know this is a real thing or not? So anybody got an idea as to what we're going to do? So one of the ideas is to send in, quote, a mystery shopper, um, send them in, see if they get a receipt at the end, and you know, have them pay with cash. I'd even mark the money and see if the money comes through the cash draw or not, which would be good. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hidden camera. Well, not, maybe not even a hidden camera, but a camera, a video surveillance. How many have video surveillance in their cash areas? Um, I think, again, an important little concept there, and we talked about this a little bit the day before yesterday, but not only for this reason, but for security um, as well. It might be a really good idea. So, okay, there's another thought. Well, let's, let's talk about the three requirements that you have as HR professionals. Um, an investigation under these circumstances, first off, if you're looking at it from the human resources side, it's not necessarily going to be the criminal side. What's your ultimate goal on the HR side? Is to determine if this person will continue to be employed by you. Um, so your question is going to be a little bit different. Your first part of this is to look and see um, you have two categories. It's what we call inclusion or exclusion, which means that if you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, I'm convinced that this is embezzlement, money is moving out uh, in a, in a, a legal manner. Inclusion means who could you put in the group of people that, who have the possibility to have achieved that goal within your business, okay? Exclusion would be individuals, maybe you have a kennel person. They don't come anywhere next to the money. They never take invoices. They never even couldn't log on to the computer, any of those types of things. So we're going to have those excluded. Now, your second part of this is going to be your investigation. Investigation in- includes your interview. They say the top thing that usually out of everything that you're going to do, um, talking to the employees individually and interviewing them about the situation yields more information than just about what you can see on a camera. Um, and here's what you're going you're gonna to do. Um, one is you start with the people who are least likely to the people who are most likely. Does that make sense? The least likely, guess what happens? Okay, I just brought you into the into my office, and I sat down, and I said, you know, we're having some issues in regard to t- transactions. We're concerned. I want to make sure that everything is in place. Have you heard anything about this? I'm going to ask you open-ended questions. Now, you may not know anything about this, but what are you going to do when you leave? What did she ask you? What kind of questions? 
oh my gosh, yeah, da, 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 the, the pipeline starts. And most of the time what we find is when you get to that core of individuals where you're likely to come across the person who is involved, they know what questions have been asked, they know what, but you also be able to tell how they answer those questions, what they're going to do. I'm going to encourage you to ask three questions that usually yield pretty good answers. Um, here is the situation. Let me take you through what has occurred. How do you think that could have happened? Can they give you a logical reason, yes or no, this is what you should do? Um, second question on there is, who would you trust in the building? Will they point at somebody else? Chances are you've already, if you've interviewed everyone, guess what? You've already got a list of people who have been pointed out to you, aren't you? Okay. Um, and the third one is, um, a lot of the information that we have seen and gathered under these circumstances um, makes me very concerned for you and how it looks to us. What would you say back to that? Is there a possibility that if I called the police and brought them in under these circumstances, what, what would you tell them? What would we say? I'll tell you, a lot of times people right there, okay, the cops are coming. It's time it's time to say something. If they don't, then what's your next step? Do you want the police? Yeah. Someone asked about, um, uh, can I put in cameras? In most states, 40 of the United States, you are allowed to, if you have a, a criminal activity, suspected criminal activity inside of your business, um, they will waive a lot of the rules and regulations about cameras, and they will let you put a camera in without the knowledge of your employees. Um, so if you have that situation and you call the police and they tell you that, um, we've had, I can think of five circumstances where individuals have literally, um, we, you're under an investigation. They put a camera in and less than three days later, they're repeating the behavior right there in front of you. Um, it's like an addiction. Uh, so absolutely. What other types of things can we do to capture this? Well, again, I think there's a lot of um, preventative procedures that need to go into place here. So let's start off at the very, very beginning. Everyone should be doing this, and hopefully you are, but let's run through it. End of day procedure, okay? Here is the status quo, the, the, uh, the, again, the basics that everybody should be following. We're going to have um, at least one cash draw. You might have several in your practice, depending on how big you are. But we're going to have a cash draw in there. You're going to have a base amount in there. And let's call it $100. At the end of the day, whatever you do end of day, you might do it end of day or, you know, the 12 o'clock every day. But whenever you do that, your receptionist will count that cash draw back to $100. That is to the coin, to the penny, okay? Don't tell me just dollar bills, literally to the penny. Um, we're then going to run your end of day report off of the computer, and um, that's going to tell you the total of your cash, your checks, and your charge cards. So the cash that came out of the cash draw should equal what the end of day report says. The checks totaling them up should equal what the end of day report says. And you're going to run a transaction report off of your credit card machine, and that should equal what the end of day report says as well. If everything balances, you are going to make a deposit to the bank, and we make daily deposits. That doesn't mean you have to go there that day, but every, deposit, every day is going to be a deposit. We go to the bank, make a deposit. The bank will give you a receipt. You're going to bring that receipt back to the practice. That, along with the end-of-day report and your credit card transaction journal, is all stapled together and put on your owner's desk. The owner then is to review all of that, make sure it's all correct, initial it. It could be filed away, and that is kept for seven years. Statute of limita uh, limitations, seven years. Oh, a manager's in here. How many managers do we have? This is critical for you. You need to make sure that you are getting, um, you know, kind of backed up on this. Um, so you don't want all this on your shoulders. The owner needs to initial all that off, make sure that everything is cool, and then again it can be filed away. Going back to when we were doing it, if you are off on the cash, you are obviously you know, going to try to find it, we're going to look for it, etc. But if you can't find it, you are going to over or short the deposit, not your cash draw. The draw is always going to come back to that base amount of $100 or whatever it is. And then you will keep in your bookkeeping your overages and shortages so that you can monitor that there. Okay. Now along with that, 
you need to print out, out of your computer system, something that is called an itemized audit trail. The itemized audit trail shows you everything that went through that computer, um, whether it was receipted or not, voided, refunded, etc. One of the most common ways of embezzling in a veterinary practice, and by the way, I wrote an article on this, 101 ways to embezzle from a practice. We didn't even have to think hard. It was really fun. Um, but this was one of the one. Um, most common way. You tell me how we would have stopped this, okay? Um, receptionist, we'll give her a name just to name somebody, um, Susan, is embezzling from the practice, okay? What she's doing is she's watching other receptionists in the practice during the course of the day. And if there is a cash transaction that occurs, Susan made a mental note of it. So Mrs. Jones came in this morning, brought in Casey, got an exam, vaccination, heartworm medication, and it was $120 she paid in cash. Susan made a note. Later in the day, Susan went into the computer when nobody was around and created what's called a negative invoice. She went into Mrs. Jones' account, went into Casey's account, and created another invoice. But now it was minus one for the exam, minus one for the vaccination, minus one for the heartworm medication. Now it showed minus $120. She took that money out of the cash drawer, put it in her pocket, and she uh, got rid of the receipt. How would we have known that that occurred within the practice? That's the only place that will show that itemized audit trail. It would show that positive transaction in the morning, the negative one in the afternoon. Um, I can't tell you how many practices don't print that out. That, again, needs to be reviewed by the owner. Managers, you do. I mean, that's what your job. Yeah, you're going to review it, but you need to be make sure that you're backed up as well so the owner should periodically be reviewing that. It takes a minute or two. Just look at any of the negative transactions. The other reports I want printed out of the computer are fee exception report. Anytime we charge more or less than stated fee, that will show up on that report, um, and that will be a real key indicator for you as well. Um, Password protection. Go to it. Absolutely, positively. The one most common thing that we find is that everybody uses the same password. Um, I want to know whose password those things are taking place. We can control them. You're going to have four levels of passwords, okay? The top level is what we refer to them as God or the administrator, whichever way you want to look at that. Um, but they have access to everything in the system for any reason. Who should have that privilege? Who needs to do that? The owner. Your owner. Absolutely. Next level down is what we would call the super user. And what that means is that you need to run reports to check on inventory or how your financials are doing and those types of things. That individual who has in that category can do that. The next level down is um, uh, special needs. So someone's doing reminders for you. Um, someone uh, writes out all of the hospital notes, any of those types of things, makes changes and things. They have that privilege. The majority of the people that you have in the building at level one, they can print an invoice, they can put in information, and such, but they can't alter these types of things. You will change your passwords every 90 days. Every 90 days. And that and the password is not valid if it is written on a sticky and put on the front of your computer, okay? Um, it, we go into the sy systems all the time, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the name of your clinic. I'm going to put in your name. I'm going to put in cat. the abbreviation dog. cat, dog, <laughs> your pets, your kids' names, any of those types of things. Nine times out of ten, I get it. And it, it's just not that hard. So you do not have password protection if everybody has a password that they've had since the dawn of time. Because you, how many of you really, you know someone else's password right now? So we want to be really careful with that. I want, I want to tell my favorite story. Oh, no. This, this, I, and believe, this, I'm telling you just so that you will remember how important this is. True story. Veterinarian down in Florida had a big blowout with the owner of the practice. Um, they wouldn't tell me what it was about, but it had something to do with the girl. I know that part. But anyway, there was this big, big fight between this associate doctor and the owner. And the associate decided that he was going to go open his own practice. So he rented a storefront about three blocks away from the current practice. And unbeknownst to the owner, started to you know outfit the practice and set it up and do all this stuff. Well, when he was ready, he went into the practice. He was still working the same practice all along. He went into that practice, and he wrote a letter to the entire client base telling everybody what a jerk the owner was, that he was opening his own practice, he was going to be three blocks away, they should all follow him, and they should all leave this practice. And he wrote that letter, 
adding insult to injury, printed it on that practice's stationery and ran it through their postage machine, right? And sent it all out and then listen to this. He wiped out the entire client base. Deleted the entire client base. The last backup they had was the end of the last year and this was August of that year. They lost eight months of information. How did he get that password? The owner had given it to him. And uh, again, unbeknownst, uh, you know, went in and did that. Um, again, this God password. How many of you, you know, think that it's not known by others um, in the practice? When was the last time that you changed that? Um, the other thing is your backups. And again, are you doing those religiously and, and well as well? Uh, but, you know, these are all issues that uh, tie into this as well in your practice. So uh, make sure, again, you do change and update password and do that on a 90-day basis. Um, 10, 10, eight, uh, let, let's talk about just human nature for a moment, because the fact of the matter is, is the majority of the people that you work with are honest. You know, it's only a few. Um, do you know right now they say that 30% of the businesses that are failing are failing not because of the economy. It's because the economy has hit them and they already have embezzlement issues. 30% of the businesses that will fail have an embezzlement issue. And that's what made them susceptible to the economy. Could have probably survived one or the other, but the two together, lethal combination. Um, 10% of, of individuals on the planet, no matter what you did, any circumstances, no way, no how, would they ever steal anything. 10% of the population will take anything just to, for the privilege of being able to steal it. It's, it's just that's the way they do business. That's it is. Chances are you don't see too many of those folks. That's a good thing. 80% of the population, that's the majority of most of us in here, would not generally steal something unless under extraordinary circumstances. Think for a moment. Um, your child is really sick. You don't have health insurance for them. It's, gonna, it's just going to wipe you out. What's taken a few hundred dollars to try and save them? You're going out, you're going to lose your home unless you have um, your mortgage payment. Your kids are going to be sleeping in a cardboard box at the corner. Would you steal something under those circumstances? Most of us would say, you know, under those types of things, it would sure at least cross our minds. So let's be honest. So what I'm going to tell you that as a, a practice owner, practice manager, just take it off the table. Don't put temptation in front of folks that for a moment they had a bad circumstance and they made a bad choice. Um, 30% of the population in the United States doesn't see it as stealing to take something from their employer's place of business. Okay? No, think. That what Some guy comes in, hands you a whole pile of heartworm medication for free. All the money that you make, and I've got three dogs. You gave me enough hardware medication for one dog, and they gave it to you. Why can't I just get the rest? Um, one of the things that we also will do when we're auditing a clinic is I'm going to pull up the, the medical records for all of the employees. I want to see their pets. Does what they use, what they purchase match? I have to tell you, I have six animals, and they're a constant thing, and if you... Uh, if I worked at the clinic, then I better show that all my medications, all my heartworm, all my flea protection, if you're giving it to them free, no, no problem. Good for you. That's wonderful. I think you should. Um, why isn't it in the medical record? Why doesn't it show those things? Where does it come from? Um, so we just want to say, let's make it so everybody knows that we're all honest and you're not going to put people in situations they're going to have to look guilty in. That's what it, it is about. All right, let's um, make sure we have some of these things covered off on, and hopefully we're going to close some of the doors to embezzlement. You're going to do your end-of-day procedure. Um, maybe consider video uh, cameras in your practice. I think it's a hell of a great idea. Um, we are going to talk a lot we'll about video. We'll talk a lot video. more about that and legalities and all that stuff in a few minutes here. Um, you know, send somebody in with a Mark $20 bill. See if it gets into um, you know, the cash draw or not. Um, send in a mystery shopper within your practice. Um, again, as Sheila said, look at the records on employees. Um, are they buying you know, the medications, et cetera, that are equivalent for their pets? But we need to certainly realize that this is an unfortunate um, you know, occurrence in a lot of practices here. 
So establish a policy. One other thing um, we didn't even talk about, we're going to get into probably a lot a little bit later on one of the other issues, um, pre-employment type of screening. How many are doing background checks on their employees? What is that all about, guys? Think about that. I only had three hands up in this whole room. Why don't we do a background check? Now there are electronic background checks. Cost you about 40 bucks. Don't you want to know if that person um, you know, has a criminal record? We just, this, this wasn't funny. Um, we were um, uh, working with a practice, and they were hiring a practice manager. And, you know, they found this person, and they thought they were so great. Um, and then we were talking to them, and we um, suggested a background test check on this person. We did a background screen. She had embezzled from a dentist's office. She was convicted of embezzlement. Um, and then again, here they're hiring her. You think they, she said that on her application? Um, so and guys, people are not staying in prison. I want to be nice, but like if you're in California right now, they said the average person who's going in for a nonviolent crime spends 10% of their sentence. 10%. Most of them are getting parole. They're getting special conditions. There's no place to put them. So everybody said, well, why aren't they in prison? There is no room for them, and these are considered not the big risk individuals. And we're going to get into this a lot, so I don't want to take away our thunder, but um, I would strongly recommend, we'll get into some other things too on this, but you put on your application form a release form to do a background check on that person, and at some point in the hiring process, you're going to do that, usually before the working interview, uh, but I, we've started doing this routinely. Um, I don't care if we're hiring a kennel person or a veterinarian. Um, I, here's a, another true story. It blew me away. Six months ago, a practice was hiring a veterinarian up in New Jersey. Um, we did a license check. They weren't licensed. And they had worked at another veterinary hospital. Yeah. Um, so, again, we need to make sure that all this stuff is, is uh, occurring here. Um, so you put that form on your application. They sign it when we're ready to do it. Um, again, we'll give you companies as to where we can get that as well. So we're going to have policies oh, can, in, in place Just got here. a question. Yes. Is that for California? Yes. 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 Yep. Sheila it, it, is it, HR certified, by the way, everybody, which means that she knows a lot more than I know, but we uh, try to stay up on all of our federal well, And I laws. know enough to be really scared in California. There you go. Absolutely. Um, California has special requirements as to what you can and can't do. You can have a release form. You are allowed to say if this person is going to drive for you, then you can have a look at their driver's license record. Um, if they are going to be around controlled substances, you can look for that. Uh, if they're going to be handling pets and such, you can look for violent behavior. Um, it has to match up with what the job description for that position. If they're not going to handle money, you can't look at their credit history. Does that make sense? Uh, the way background, the background checks so everybody's on the same page, she's saying, can I call their prior employer? Um, the information from their prior employer usually comes up on the background check. Do you have the right to call a prior employer and say, are they eligible for rehire? Yes. You can. And just so we're clear, California, New York, New Jersey, Kansas, any state that you are in, there is a, a misunderstanding that I can't tell you about a prior employee's uh, job or employment information. You most certainly can. In fact, your risk is higher if you don't than if you do. Let me give you an example. Uh, I call and I want to know what Mark was like as a prior employee. Um, he says, they say, well, you know, he's not eligible to be hired. That doesn't tell you too much, but it gives you an answer, doesn't it? Would you hire them? No. You can tell any information about a prior employee as long as you can document that it transpired. If I say Mark uh, was worthless and never came to work on time, um, can I substantiate that? That's not going to be an easy one. Can I say that out of 60 days that he was employed by us, he was late 58 of them, and on most occasions I found him uh, staring off into space, um, contemplating his belly button, not doing his job. Um, I have five occasions where he had discussions about that. You're fine. You are perfectly within your rights to, to share that information. I would encourage you to have good documentation. Then you can do that. 
Florida has a case right now that's going on that is really concerning a lot of people. A clinic uh, had an individual who committed an act of violence against another employee. Uh, that employee who was violent left and you know went to another clinic. That clinic called the first clinic for a reference. The first clinic said, you know, uh, he's fine, he's okay. Never said any a word about the, what had occurred. Guess what happened? He did it again, uh, act of violence at this one. The, the second clinic is being sued, of course, by the employee who, who was put in this situation. Um, the other, the clinic is now uh, filed suit against the first clinic because they said, uh, you lied to us. You didn't tell us what, the, what this was here. So we're going to see a lot more of that. You are at risk for what you don't say under those circumstances. So anything that is documented can be you can. Yes, uh, you can. Uh, and I know it goes against everything we've been told, like, no, never give away any information. Yes or you no. can do yes. yes or no. Start, starting, you know, date, end date, uh, rate of pay, uh, eligible for rehire. If you have it in there that they were counseled seven times for this, you, you can say that. You just, what happens is that most of us do not have really strong employment records. We have not done our due diligence and our employment uh, information, so we, we tend to hold back. So when you call on an employee to a previous uh, job that they were working at, it's the job of the place that they were working at previously to have the documentation, or is it your job to verify that they have the your, your goal, what is your goal when you call them? Uh, do I have a potential fit of a good experience from their prior employee? Employer. So that's what I want to know. That's what their responsibility is. If they didn't do good documentation and they say, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I wasn't they here. Me, if they were to tell me he was, you know, if they were to start ruling off uh, things that happened to the person and they have no documentation of it, is that my responsibility to make sure they have that documentation? You ask, you ask for the, you know, you can't see the documentation, but you can say you have, a, you know, information. Because remember, uh, half the time when you call someone else, you're going to talk to somebody who may have never even run across this employee. Uh, so you can't go by personal. But uh, is it your responsibility to make sure that they did their job? It's your decided to tell me if that's a credible re uh, representation of that individual. That's what your role is. And we have a scenario that's going to deal with yeah. this a little bit more. Um, but let me give you one other thought on that. Why are you spending your time doing this? There are companies, and we'll give you a name, HR Plus is one of them. HR Plus, Higher uh, Best. What is the other one? Hi, uh, uh, HR Plus, um, Higher Best. Higher Best. Um, the other one I would like is uh, ERB. ERB. Um, these are all companies, and that's what they do. Um, in fact, uh, we went to a big 10,000-person meeting uh, called uh, the Society of Human Resource Managers. Um, there's booths all over the place, you know, the companies that do this. It's like $40 for a report. Um, and you will find out, you know, background information. You'll find out there's criminal activity, um, all those kind of things. Um, so, you know, we'll give you some of those sources. I'll show you one of those reports. But um, getting, staying with our embezzlement theme right now, maybe we could have minimized that possibility had we done a background check on that person. And, again, a strong recommendation that you do that. Um, we'll also talk about pre employment drug testing. 75% reduction is what they say in small businesses overall who use um, background checks prior to, uh, to not. And that's for illicit, that would be for theft of items, that would be for cash, um, that would also be for violent acts. Well, we haven't even talked about that. Theft of product out of your practice. How many think that that's not happening in your practice? You're exactly right. Um, so, you know, it's to what degree is it occurring, right? Um, and that's really what we want to know about here. And, again, what can we do to stop that? Um, but, you know, you might want to do an inventory. You know, what are the things that the employees are going to potentially steal? A heartworm flea control food. How about you do an inventory on Monday and you do an inventory on Friday? And you take out what was sold and you add in what you got and see what happens. Um, but it's going to open your eyes to a lot of those kind of things. Why not a video camera in that area of the practice where those products are? How many of you have those products under lock and key in your practice? Well, you know what? Inventory control managers say you can't control inventory if it's not under lock and key. Um, it's open access here, especially, again, if you're 24-hour practice. Um, we all don't want that to happen to us. It's all going to happen. Again, it's to what degree. Um, so let's, let's do this. Let's have a policy 
Um, do you even have a policy in your employee procedures manual that theft is unacceptable? Um, I, you, you need to state this. You need to, again, removal of hospital property is unacceptable behavior within our practice. Um, we need to be asking questions, going over those reports. Um, again, the itemized audit trail is the exception report. Um, again, it's hard to not make judgments, but we got to be careful about that. And we want to make sure that employees feel that they can be honest with you um, so that they know that they uh, can bring things forward without repli- you know, repercussions of that information coming back at them. But we need to establish clear, effective policy. How many in your practice have in your employee procedures manual a policy of honesty? Seriously? I think you got to have that in there. Um, you know, that is what the expectation is. There was, this is, this is, again, just stupid. There was a practice in Texas that fired a receptionist for not being friendly. The receptionist went to the labor board and said, my employer didn't tell me I had to be friendly. It wasn't on my job description. It wasn't anywhere. They didn't say it. The labor board required them to hire her back. <laughs> I thought that was crazy. Um, you know, you need to have the statement of expectation that you expect them to be honest. And that needs to be, again, in the employee manual as well. So we are going to state our policy. Well, and let's tell folks how we're going to help them out here. Because do we do have a web uh, address that we're going to give you. Um, so if we mention, gosh, wouldn't it be good to have a policy like this? Gosh, wouldn't you need the list of questions you can ask during a reference or what you can't? We'll post that to that page. And then you can download those during the next 30 days with our compliments, okay? So you don't have to say, how do I come up with that? How am I supposed to, you know, we'll help you. So you don't have to worry about some of those things. You can say, yep, I can do that. And we always tell people, we can be your very biggest secret. Because you can go back, tell your boss, you spent days writing this policy (laughs) and nights researching it. And I don't know why it has that other clinic's name in it. (laughs) Yeah, I always tell people, you know, when when we ask you to raise your hand, if you got something, if I was in your seat, I'd look around. Because that's the person I'm going to corner out there during the break and say, I'll trade you my honesty policy for your confidentiality pledge. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. Take advantage. Of, uh, we're, we're not on an island here. And, you know, the hallmark, I think, of our, our seminars is practicality. So we're going to make it very practical for you. We will put that website up there. We'll give that to you at the end of the uh, session here. All right. Let's get into Ooh, we sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Which one do we want to do next? This one? Uh, we had, we, yeah, we, I think the top two there were uh, harassment. Okay. And uh, so we've embezzled, and now it's time to harass. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, All Creatures Animal Hospital, name change to protect the guilty. Yes, ma'am. What happened to Helen? (laughs) Go ahead, Helen. Yeah, guess what happened to Helen. Um, What they did is that uh, the uh, owner finally began to start thinking about uh, all of the years that have gone by where things did not match up. Um, So they called the police. The police said, we would recommend that you put a a camera in under surveillance, and let's see what we can find out. In less than 48 hours, they had several instances with Helen making changes and taking cash out of the drawer. Um, It looks like Helen had been doing it for nearly 20 years. Yeah. Um, Now, can you imagine you're an owner? Yeah, talk about a trust-shattering occasion. There it is. Um, The team members were pretty upset after all this investigation and people and all those types of things because it was a fairly small town, to tell you the truth. Um, The team members wanted the camera to stay in after Helen was gone. Yeah, Helen was not prosecuted, by the way. They just asked her to retire. He just did not have the. Which wasn't he a said problem because Helen owned think. three condos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not kidding. She owned three. Helen owned, had Doctor Simmons' retirement. She had money and she did well with it. But yeah, she she owned three condos. Yeah. Yes. Are there any legalities for what we should What do you mean legality? Um, Can I tell the other? Can I yeah. tell the other employees? Um, most of the time, if you conclude someone's employment, I don't say I fired them or they quit. I say that they con- they have concluded their employment here. I'm not going to go around with the team and say Helen embezzled for from us. That's you know. So I'm very careful about that. They're going to find out. However, um, the details of that uh, I would not discuss. 
you have a great um, great vine in your practice. Every practice does. Um, you don't need to say a damn thing. They know. They probably know more than you do. Yeah. Um, and they probably knew it way before you yeah. did. They've been well. to the condo. Yeah. <laughs> They've been staying at the condo. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's amazing to me. Um, I have been involved in a lot of cases or been privy to a lot of embezzlements and practices. And of all of those, and, and probably several hundred, um, I only know a couple that actually were prosecuted. Yeah. And what always happens is they say, you know, it's expensive to do it, it's timely to do it, you know, you got to prove this, you got to prove that, et cetera. So we don't see a lot of prosecutions happen, which I think is terrible. I, I think it should happen. Uh, but I can certainly understand. I mean, you, your practice owner, you know, do you want to spend all this time gathering all this information, going through all your records? I went through an IRS audit, you know, in my own company not all that long ago. It was a big pain in the neck just to get all that information together. You know, we came out fine, but, you know, it was a lot of work and time to do it. Imagine an embezzlement, all the stuff you got to go through. So, again, it doesn't normally go through prosecution. Um, I don't know the legalities about paying it back. Several situations I know the employees have agreed to pay back outside of a court judgment, and I think in some of them they actually have. Um, others, again, of course, have not. Um, and I'm sure it varies from state to state, prosecution, prosecution, everything else. But um, I'll just tell you from experience what I see more happen, what, what happens more times than not is somebody is thought to be guilty, may even say they're guilty, and then, you know, they go, okay, and they walk away and just don't ever come back here, don't ever, you know, show your face again, and that's it. That's normally how it works. Yes? Are you obligated to tell other hospitals? Now, this, again, if you, if the employee said that they, you know, stole, you know it for a fact. Um, you know, yes, I would say you are. I don't know if it's legal, but I would say you're morally obligated. Um, obviously, if they were prosecuted, here's a biggie. You think this person, you think Helen stole from you. She didn't really acknowledge it, but she said, well, I'm going to quit or leave anyway. Now she is interviewing somewhere else. What do you say? Um, and if you said, well, I let her go because I thought that she's, you know, stealing from us, um, is that defamation of character? And it could very well be. Because yeah, so we can be ask careful. people if they've ever been convicted of something. We can't ask if they've ever been arrested right. for something. So under this circumstance, without information, you really cannot disclose it. And you can again, say you let her let go under these circumstances. And then again, you got that situation, you know, involved again. Uh, that, that person could very well be doing it again. You haven't told, but again... Yeah, there's a catch-22. If you can't prove it, if it's not documented, you can't, you know, say it without getting potentially yourself in trouble. Yes? No. Usually not. No. No. Yes? Can you go back and do background checks on your employees? Current employees? Um, I'm going to... Um, it can be a very... First off... Uh, depending on how those, ca those come back, what are you willing to do? So, you know, you get three back and you say they won't call. Uh, are you going to let them go? Uh, you know, under those circumstances, I say be careful of the doors that you open. Um, what you can do, you are perfectly within the right to say from this moment forward, we will be doing background checks for anybody that we hire from this point. You're allowed to do that. These guys don't have to do them in the building if you don't. Yeah. And I usually tell you, stay stay out of that water. Because like I said, ooh, I've seen them where they've got 8 out of 10 individuals will now not qualify. Uh, so what are you going to do? But you can do it from this point forward. It's pretty easy. By seven. the way, how much does it co cost? How much does it cost to do a background check? About $40. For individual? Yeah, check. between 40 we'll, we'll and $80. Show, yeah. Yep. yeah. Hey, uh, sexy, let's go ahead here. <laughs> hey. Let's get into sexual harassment. Yes, Sally. yes. Um, Let me refer you to page 32 yeah, of our manual. All, right. <laughs> um, all Creatures Animal Hospital is a large facility. They have over 70 employees. Both Nick and Paula are veterinary technicians who have been with the practice for over four years. Paula recently come to Cindy with a problem. Paula's noticed that Nick is constantly on the internet 
when no one is looking or when it's slow and is viewing porn on the internet. Oh, that never happens. Um, in fact, this morning, Nick called Paula over to the computer and wanted to show her, have you uh, ever done that? Uh, Paula is very upset, wants to quit. She does not want to confront Nick because everyone likes him. And if she says anything to him, he will make her life miserable. Wow. This was your case, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah this is fun. Absolutely. And can, well, I guess that would be, it was in Utah. Yes. <laughs> in Utah. So is this a problem? <laughs> yes. Um, how many of you guys know what's going on in your computers after hours and even maybe during hours? Good for you. Um, you know, you. we certainly, this is, believe me, more of an issue than you want to know. A lot of times we'll go into a practice, we will pull down the history bars, we'll go into the bios of the computer, and we will see the sites that people have been at. Uh, more times than not, it's pretty darn surprising. There are a lot of this type of activity. The m- number one thing that they spend their time on on the Internet? Besides MySpace and My Facebook. MySpace, Facebook. But you know another biggie? Monsterjobs.com. Yeah, they are looking for jobs while they're working. You are paying them to look for another job. Isn't that fun? So um, what steps are we going to take in dealing with this, and how are we going to deal with Nick? What do you think? Anybody have questions about this case before we uh, proceed? Anybody want any more background? Real-life situation, sir? I won't tell you the site name. I'm sorry. (laughs) Has another employee ever document or said anything um, not that we were aware of? None. No. None. No. First None. time that this uh, actually came to the surface here? Now, somebody talked to the owner, but there was no documentation because, oh, I forgot to say that. Nick is the owner's son. Oh, <laughs> well, why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, remember, it's a 70-employee hospital, so it's a pretty big hospital. Um, And and it's a 24-hour facility. Yeah, and several of the computers have open access to Internet. Um, They currently had no screening on there. They had no, um, you know, um, tools at all to, you know, see what was being done or where they were or not, et cetera. They had no current policy in there at all whatsoever. Um, which is going to be one of our biggie takeaways here. How many of you have a policy currently on Internet usage in your practice? Very nice. Very good. About, About 40%, half the room. yeah. Every, but it well, doesn't help. You have to enforce the dang point. thing. Yeah, point. I was going to say. Um, we all need to have a policy on that. We'll be talking about that. And then exactly. before we move forward, anybody else from California? Anyone else from California? Okay. Anyone over 22 employees in California, you have to do sexual harassment training um, as a whole, you're required to. So if you catch me afterwards, I can help you get that set up. But you are required to, to have a whole process in place uh, if you, you're there. If you're not there, you're in all these other states, what are you going yeah. to do? We call it the Republic of California. They have all their <laughs> own stuff going on there. Yeah. yeah. Other questions about the, uh, the background on this case? Yes. How do we know it's Nick? Okay. Unless, you know, and there was no password where you're boom, getting in there and whatever. So we could look in the computers. In fact, we did. And we saw, and we, there's actually time as to how much time they spend. Nick was spending a lot of time. Um, you know, um, he was having a lot of fun there. So, um, but we don't know at this point it was Nick, nor could we prove that it was Nick that was doing that. Any video surveillance? Say again, please. Video surveillance. Yeah, no. Um, her question was, was there any video surveillance? The answer is no, not in that practice. Well, yes. you might want to see it, but you got to also see what's on the computer, you know, and what yeah. they're looking at the same yeah. time. All right. So, Julie, you want to take Says, us through some of this? Any, any time is that someone steps forward and makes the statements, uh, their concerns, you are required to investigate. Federal law steps into the arena right here, right now, and says you are now supposed to investigate. Now, the investigation has these components involved. 
you are to take the information from the individual who's making that statement or that concern to you. Um, you are required to tell them that you are going to investigate the situation and you are going to get back to them with your finding. You are required to go back to them after your investigation and say, yes, I agree, this is what the situation was, or no, we don't agree on what has occurred. Um, but you have to give them a reply, and you have to tell them the timeline that you're going to follow, not that I'll, I'll catch back up with you. You are required the, to show them that you're going to do that investigation, and then what you find uh, as a result of that, what are you going to do? Now, uh, each of those steps, the first thing is, is quite often someone who makes these types of statements does not want everyone in the building to know that, that this has occurred or they're concerned about it. Or other people may think, you know, Nick's just having fun. Don't pay any attention to him. He's not harmful. He, you know, at least he's not doing something else. He's, you know, we know where we're going to find him. Um, any of those types of things. Um, if this is a concern, um, harassment is defined it's a perception. So if everybody else in the building is perfectly comfortable with this behavior, but Sarah is not, you still have an issue, okay? So we do not want to dial it down or tell somebody, oh, come on, um, stop being such a prude or stop being so uh, in, uh, considered uh, of the situation. You have to go and investigate. So you're going to talk to uh, other team members who are in that circle in that environment, what did they see, what has happened, what's occurred. You're going to talk to Nick about what this behavior is. The fact of the matter is, um, if you have a policy in place uh, about sexual harassment, this is your time to sit down and review that with Nick and tell him the penalties involved with this behavior. Is this acceptable? Is there any way in the world we could sneak this one in under the wire? It's a judgment call? No, it is not and it should be have a zero tolerance basis. And let me share with you that what happens if you have a policy in place that tells what people are going to follow that, and this needs to be the spot where you have zero tolerance because um, we have a lot of, of uh, issues that can come into play here. So your responsibility, follow up, go back to the individual. Now, um, these issues also, um, if they are unresolved, they affect the overall morale of your team um, because it's like, okay, we've got this serious problem. We talked about it, but nothing is going to get done. You must demonstrate that something is going to get done. Your uh, hardship in this, if you will, is that you're not going to be at liberty to pull everybody aside and say, I just kicked Nick's butt. He's not going to do that again. Or he's two steps closer to the door. We don't have that ability. We're going to take care of this. Um, and he can have a formal reprimand. You can conclude his employment. You have choices on that. But you're not going to be allowed to go back to other people. You do have the right to go back to the person who made the claim and say that we have handled this. I appreciate you coming forward. You will not have to face the situation. If there is any uh, commentary or anything that comes back from him or any other individuals, it will be handled and it will not be tolerated. Um, so you need to come in here so we maintain everybody else's. The other thing is, too, is um, what we find is that everybody's talking about this. It becomes this huge issue. Um, so I would absolutely, positively say 75% of these cases are um, avoided. If you put the pieces in place, put your policies, do your training, sit down with your team every year and let them know what is acceptable and not acceptable behavior. Um, so we're going to maintain that. Um, yes. Uh, the individuals under these circumstances, if you come back, they don't like the reply that you gave. They don't think that you did what you were supposed to do. Uh, can they contact uh, an attorney? Can they file a, a suit? Can they go against you under uh, the, the acts that protect them from this? They can. And you need to remember if you do your steps, they may do that anyway. So following it, staying in course, you know that um, you're going to be able to handle that. But that is a very rare occasion. 
And just so everybody knows, I mean, anything in the work environment, whether it's distasteful little jokes up on the refrigerator or things that get circulated or things that we say or comments we make about clients or uh, what clients are wearing, any of those types of things, you need to know no tolerance. Just start right there. It's going to be easier for you to maintain the environment. Yeah, she's saying, well, you know, what, what is an acceptable environment? And the, the way that they have defined is what is acceptable to everybody in the building. Um, people who don't say anything to you, um, it's, it's, silence is consent is what they say. If you don't say something, you must be okay with it. This is not one of those circumstances. Um, I always tell, take the acid test. Would you say that in front of a room full of nuns? Would you say it in front of a room full of your moms, you know, at a kindergarten meeting? You know, if there's certain things that you, you are off the path on, I usually tell people, you know, we don't know what's offensive to different people. It would be best to just stay in the middle here. She just say, you know, that could be misinterpreted by individuals. So let's just make sure that it's comfortable for everybody, then it is acceptable. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unsaid is really the unknown. I mean, I'm exactly what she's saying. Yeah. If we, she's saying, you know, okay, well, if it's unsaid and they don't tell me they have a problem, I just say there's an acid test, and you should be able to take that. You know, that's how they decide if this movie is PG, G, or R. Um, they, there is some. So, which which was it? PG's okay. R's not. Is a uh, chip in. What is a great way to open that up is to sit down to pull out the the standard sexual harassment policy, and it will go through everything from, you know, prid quo quo, if you promise sexual things for the exchange for this, that's not allowed. If you make these kind of statements, that's not allowed. Everybody gets a chance to say, okay, I understand. I didn't even think of that statement as being derogatory. Have a clinic where there's 25 women and there's one gentleman in there. And um, he said, I, there are definitely times where I, def- I feel a little uncomfortable about things. Okay? Then it's not right. Excuse, one, one second. Just um, exactly what we're talking about, and I got this from the back just so, and we'll keep this in the back so you can see it. But this is our, our tools book. This is what we use when we do consults with practices. There's a whole section here on harassment. Um, and we'll also publish this on the website for you. But there's uh, several pages here, and it says, you know, our practice is committed to providing a work environment that is free of sexual harassment, any other harassment or intimidation, whether based on gender, race, sexual orientation, color, religion, national origin, age, or disability. And then it goes to the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. Um, as Sheila said, uh, quid pro quo, we go through what is uh, sexual harassment, unwanted sexual advantage, uh, advances, offering employment benefits in exchange for sexual favors, making uh, threatening reprisals after negative response to sexual advance, visual um, conduct, including leering, making sexual gestures. I mean, really, really specific. This is what you go through with your team members. Um, But it's got to be in a written format. Um, I don't care the size of your practice. Two employees, you know, 70 employees. Um, I've had labor board actions where there's three or four employees in a practice, and one of them felt that they were harassed, they can, you know, certainly bring a harassment to issue against your practice. And we'll put the, uh, why, even if you're not in California, um, they have a, the, the brochure that they have that everybody has to be handed to them when they go to work at a California uh, uh, business. It has good information. And it says, you know, this is how we keep our environment productive and positive for everybody. Um, I, I'll put the link up there, but download that one. It's a great thing to sit down with your team and say, let's make sure we're all on the same page here. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Any type of harassment, yeah, and that would be covered in here as well. So um, 
that was a verbal harassment before, you know, when I first started the section, you know, with Sheila. So, yes, um, that's, yeah, any type of harassment. So it doesn't have to be under a sexual connotation. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, I had a practice up in Washington State, okay? Um, the, um, one of the technicians um, came to the practice owner and said, the other uh, doctor in this practice, who was a partner, um, was sexually harassing me. Is uh, basically just making innuendos and you know inappropriate uh, comments every once in a while. And the owner of the practice, ah, nah, that's that's Sam. Sam's like that. You know, don't worry about him. He's just kind of an old geezer. Uh, don't pay attention to him. Is that okay? No. no. What happens if the owner doesn't deal with it? Just as responsible as a person who's doing it. So managers in here. If it comes to your attention, you need to deal with that as well. And again, you're going to have that in your manual. Normally what it's going to say, if you bring to me you know, a situation, I as the manager will investigate. I will find out you know, what I can, and I will report back to you, the employee, in a written document what it is that I have done. And hopefully that will solve it. If it doesn't get solved, in your opinion, the employee, then uh, you can bring it again to uh, management, bring, give us a written statement as to what you feel the issues are. We will again investigate, and we will report back to you in a written format as to what we have done to resolve this. Um, if you still feel it's not favorably resolved, then of course you have the right to go to outside sources or anything else you want to do. But that is our policy. That is what we're going to do and how we're going to respond to it. So you need to have in your employee manual what that is, what the employees expect to do, what you're going to do in response to that anytime these situations arise. Um, I am the chief of Are you their supervisor? Yes. So it, 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 you're the go-to. Um, so they usually go to their direct supervisor. Now you can go to the practice manager and sit down and say, here's what's occurring, yeah. And then you, you're going to funnel back to that individual. But, yeah, you're going to own it. Okay. Mm -hmm. you got to bring it up the higher. We're going to write up the uh, name of the, uh, the, the website. Webpage. Yep, and, and then we uh, have to take a break for lunch. Well, we got through two of them. We got through two. We only have 13 have more cases to go, so we're, we're good. But there are lots of, lots of different topics, there. things, so the, we can spend more time on some, less time on others, depending on what interests you. We're going to give you the web page address um, that has up there the documents that we're talking about. Um, I'll also write my email address up there so that if something isn't where you found it or you can't remember what it's called or whatever, you'll be able to find me and we can, we can hook you up with what you need there. What's most important, like I said, you're not alone. You've got lots of choices. There's a lot of probably people who have gone that path. Take advantage of it. Look at that resource. And I think this conference is really an extraordinary opportunity to talk to other individuals who do the same thing as you. Share your tools. Share your resources. That is going to be a hidden page. It will be up there for 30 days. All these documents and the rest we're going to talk about today will be there. Um, so please um, take advantage of that, but it's only going to be up there for a limited time. Sheila will also put up her own. Again, Sheila is a great, and by the way, um, we have a, a newsletter. The very first part of that is our website, dmc-inc.com. We have a newsletter. Um, we will put up, you know, all these HR things and talk to you about some different issues. It's free. Uh, you can go, go on there and sign up for it. Um, example, red flag laws. They're coming into play in June. Everybody know that? You ready for what it? What about Gina? You know, I'll um, know about you know Gina. About Gina? No. Gina, you know about Chipra? No. Stay you will. tuned. Come back after lunch. <laughs> lunch, guys. We'll see you and have a good lunch time.